hello. Today we are going to talk about body language um, and specifically in relation to uh, job interviews. Hello, Kayleen Martin, founder of Ripple Recruitment, talent agent and recruitment specialist. So today I would like to welcome you to another episode in our series of Family and Friends. And I'm really excited to introduce you to body language and nonverbal communications expert and founder of the People Toolbox, Elizabeth Hur. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about being here. Good, so am I. All right. Um, so Elizabeth believes that intentional communication is at the heart of every successful interaction. Uh, she is passionate about teaching people how to harness effective body language in order to uh, increase their confidence, um, be intentional about how they present themselves and take more control over the outcomes of their interactions. So today, Elizabeth will share with us some uh, body language tips um, that you can use during your job interview. Um, so thank you again, Elizabeth, for joining us. Uh, so before we get into your tips, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your business, The People Toolbox? Well, yes, thanks, Kelly. Um, I used to be a classic introvert. I was shy. I was drained by all kinds of interactions and parties and meetings and stuff. I was a wallflower that hid somewhere in the dark corners and um, really self-conscious most of my young life into early adulthood as well. I have a nursing background with mental health and then I homeschooled my kids and my husband and I have always been big on communication and that's how I found body language when I was looking for a good communications um, curriculum really. And since I've learned body language, how to interpret it well and especially how to be aware of myself and my own body behavior and how to become intentional in my interactions, it's completely changed my social landscape. And I love it so much and I've changed so much and my interactions have been so much more pleasant. And so it's, it's a gift that I would like to give other people. And it's out of that desire that the People Toolbox is, was born really. And the thing for me that I really like is instead of me asking, because I used to do this, like what can anybody really gain from having me in the conversation? is changing it to what will they miss out on if I'm not part of it? And that's what I want my clients to ask, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. And so many people, I mean, growing up, I don't know whether we were aware as young people that there was an introvert and an extrovert and perhaps some, even somewhere in between. So it's very interesting to see um, how many people are self-confessed uh, introverts and will use communication skills, verbal and non-verbal, to overcome that. And as you say, um, to enable them to get more out of their communication. So that's that's really cool. Okay, yeah. thanks Elizabeth. So let's dive right into question number one. So is it true that um, our words only count for 7% of our communication? Oh, I love the question. <laughs> uh, I do love that question and love that you asked that because it's something that frustrates me incredibly much. Um, you hear a lot of body language trainers or coaches saying body language is absolutely 55% of our communication, our vocal tone is 38% and our words only count for 7%. And I want to pull my hair out every time I hear that as if it's said as a law or black and white. The truth behind those numbers is a study done, or actually two studies that were, were done in the 1970s by Professor Albert Morabian. And he looked at incongruency between our verbals and our nonverbals. And he also looked at likes and dislikes or strong emotions. And it's based on those two things alone that those numbers came into being. And so what he suggested out of the study is that if our verbals and our nonverbals are incongruent, what people are going to read and take as truth is what they see rather than what they hear. So if I say to you, yes, I really like the job. My facial expressions are anger, frustration, disgust, maybe. My body behavior is closed up, it is aggressive, it's not good, my vocal tone is a bit angry. And so my words going, yes, I really like the job, counts for very little in the big, in the, in the big picture. 
So if I said to you, yes, I really like that, it is congruent. So you can believe what you heard, even if you didn't see what I said. But because it's congruent, you believe the whole package. But if you see one thing and hear something else, we are more inclined to believe what we see and what is presented than what we hear. So I really like, <laughs> I, I love that question because it doesn't drive me crazy when I hear people who are professional who kind of give that as law and fact. And actually I've, I've wrote this quote and I'm gonna read it to you so I don't mess it up. Professor Moravian himself actually put a disclaimer on his website and he said this, please note that this and other equations that 38557 regarding relative importance of verbal and nonverbal messages were derived from experiments dealing with communications of feelings and attitudes, i.e. likes and dislikes, Unless a communicator is talking about the feelings or attitudes, these equations are not applicable. And that is literally from the horse's mouth. So it is a misquoted, misinterpreted study outcome. Um, how in saying that, nonverbal communication is absolutely at least half of our communication. So if I'm sitting here, I can still tell you with verbally or verbally what I want you to hear, but when we bring in nonverbal behavior, it, it underpins what we say, it makes what we say more important or less important, um, it shows confidence or not. If I look at you, like if I do this, um, yes, um, yeah, it, it's, it's good, or I go, yes, it is good, there's a huge difference in how I communicate with you and how you're gonna read what I'm saying. Mm. So body language absolutely is vital. And I think we have different tools in our toolbox. We have verbal and nonverbal, we have facial expression, we have how we dress, all of those things. Let us use all that we have to communicate as effectively as we can, rather than just focus on one or the other. That's great. And I think the secret there, correct me if I'm wrong, is congruent. That they must be congruent. Um, another word for that is aligned. They must reflect each other. Um, so I think that's really important to note. The other thing that just came to mind for me there is when, when you were doing the head down. Um, you know, for some cultures that is, you know, they don't like to have direct communication, so uh, direct eye contact. So for yeah. those um, who are new to the uh, Kiwi, European, Maori culture, how we do it here in New Zealand, it's really important for them to perhaps upskill themselves on what yeah. is um, desirable in New Zealand. Yes, yes, absolutely. And context is so important. For example, people, a lot of people go, yeah, crossed arms are a negative nonverbal. Um, crossed arms are just that, crossed arms. The way we interpret it depends on the context. So if you said to me, um, Elizabeth, I'm really annoyed at you, and I got annoyed at that, I can do that, like distancing myself, closing myself off. Or I can sit here without a heater, it's winter, I come from the plains of Africa, I can sit here just because I'm cold. So it doesn't mean I'm offended or I'm distancing myself or closing myself off. And the same goes for eye contact. And I think that's why I love working with recruiters actually because you guys deal with candidates as well as clients. So if we can get the candidates to learn contextually appropriate eye contact for a Kiwi culture, but also alert the clients going when this person sits in front of you and they from example an African or an Asian culture where direct eye contact is not necessarily seen as confidence but may be disrespectful need to also take that into account. Mm. Great, thank you. That's awesome. All right, we'll move on to um, uh, my next question. Um, how important are first impressions really? Yes, um, so first impressions, it is a very, very important aspect of communication. Um, we want to see whether people are safe in general. So that is why first impressions are so important because we want to very quickly ascertain, is this person going to be a friend or is this person an enemy or a foe? So first impressions are now, research suggests now that it happens in as little as two seconds. And because it happens so quickly, 
it's mostly nonverbal. And so that is where the nonverbal aspects are the things that you can control in an interaction. Um, and so with regards to what we look at, we look at presentation, we look at what people are wearing, we listen to the, 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 vo the vocal tone, we look at whether they present confidently or not. So first impressions do happen very quickly. It isn't something that cannot be changed, but it does change, it takes a long time to change and you need to have specific things that happen over and over and over that's different from that first impression to cement that in rather than the first impression, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, there, there's a really good study on mock interviews that was done in 2000 by um, Frank ben, ben, Benieri and um, he did, he trained two people to be, to do interviewing and over a six, six week period of time he trained these people to do professional interviews. Then they interviewed 59 candidates and they had an interview for approximately 20 minutes and this interview was video recorded and watched afterwards and so the interviewers critiqued the interviewees based on likability, trustworthiness, how professional they were and how, how likely they are to hire them for a specific job. So that was done. Then they had what they called naive observers, people who were not actually fluent in this, the art of interviewing. And they condensed the 20 minute interview, the video, into 20 second clips, only 20 seconds. And so that 20 seconds included when the candidate walked through the door, shook hands with the interviewer and sat down before they even said a word. And then they, they, they basically judged the interviewees based on the same criteria as the professional interviewers did. And they found the results were the same. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. And so it's a fascinating study as well as scary because if you have a 20 second clip and your outcome is similar to having a 20 minute interview, it does condense a lot of that whether we like somebody or not, whether we're going to hire them or not, based on that first few seconds of interaction. Yeah. Wow, that is fascinating. And, <laughs> you know, for candidates go, or applicants going for job interviews, um, it's just so important um, from my perspective because it's not like a social environment where you can meet somebody and they go, oh, I'm not sure about you, but you meet them again and you go, Oh, you might be all right. You meet them again and you go, I love you. Um, candidates or job, job seekers, they don't get that opportunity. So they must get it right the first time, much like getting their CV right the first time. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good point, Colleen. And you guys would do an excellent job at creating or crafting a great CV, speaking to the clients and up speaking the, the candidates or speaking highly of them. But when you sit in front of the interviewer, you have to really sell yourself and I think if a candidate's not well prepared, if they're not confident, they can almost undo all the work that you guys have done. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that does absolutely, absolutely happen. Um, so what they have to be prepared to do is to present themselves how they yeah. want to be received. So it's, it's not necessarily upselling themselves, but they need to quickly communicate that uh, the reason they feel they're the right fit for the job is mm -hmm. this. Okay, yeah. that's, a, that's great. Yep, it can be little things. So two things that um, I can just add to that, that can make a great first impression. And it's, it sounds little and silly in one sense, but it's literally as simple as dressing well. Mm. Because if you have, and I know Kiwi culture is a little bit, um, more casual in one sense, depends on the job you're going for. But if you're really well dressed, if your shoes are shining, if your shoes are not scuffed and your heels are clean or your, the back of your shoes are really well groomed and stuff and your, your shirt's pressed and you're not wrinkly and all that kind of things. It's a simple thing that you have 100% control over and it makes a difference because that can just be one thing that makes you stand out from all the other candidates. The other thing, and I'm glad we're back at level one, because level four will make this very, well, literally impossible, is a handshake. 
a really, really good handshake tells a lot about somebody and it can create instant connection, instant engagement. And I think sometimes it's a ritual that we kind of just go, eh, it's a handshake. But a really good handshake can be used as a tool for instant engagement. Mm, so the handshake includes um, a firm pressure. So you, you have your palm to palm, like vertical with the other person. Don't come in like this, don't come in like that. Um, equal pressure with the other person, don't crush and don't do the limp fish thing. That's just really icky. And then making eye contact, because with handshakes, you get into somebody's personal space you're making eye contact, again, it secretes oxytocin, which is an engagement chemical. You make hand, um, physical contact with shaking hands, you're closer proximity, you say something nice, it's nice to meet you, you hear all those things. So a handshake encompasses a lot of verbals and nonverbals that can create engagement and show confidence. And I think people miss that. If you just go in, oh yeah, here, uh, shake hands and then kind of walk around, do a proper handshake, a well hand, a good handshake, and you are actually set for really good engagement. Mm, I agree. We'll move on, but last one last point. In this climate, some people won't want to shake your hand, so uh, people will need to be mindful of that. But make sure your hand is clean and dry before you Absolutely. shake hands. <laughs> Vertical, firm and bra, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move on to the next tip. Um, okay, so what does a, a candidate or interviewee do whilst they're waiting for their interview? So they've arrived, the reception perhaps has set them down, and then what do they do whilst they wait? And that wait might be, you know, one minute, but it could be 10 minutes or it could be more. Mm -hmm. What do they do? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question because I think a lot of people sit down and immediately take out their mobile devices. So if you think when you sit down and you take out your phone and immediately you go like this, da -da, so you either play a game or you check emails or whatever. So I think a couple of things around that. So when you check for emails or answer texts and all those kind of things, you get out of the mindset of why you're there in the first place. So that's the first thing. It's like your mindset should be, this is an interview, I need to present confidently, etc. The second thing is on the back of the confidence statement is when we're sitting like this on our phones, we put ourselves into a low power position. We hunch our sole shoulders, our heads go down, and immediately we make ourselves smaller. Whereas we want to show confidence, we want to expand, we want to look around and make take note of what are, is around you. So I would say the one thing is to not be on your phone the, and turn it off because it's distracting and you might be in the middle of a phone call when the interviewer calls you, then you have to go, oh, sorry, I have to take this. And it just looks unprofessional and looks messy. The thing that you can do is calm yourself nicely as you sit there think of good things think of why you can have this job why it's good that they hire you and then what i always tell my clients just talk to the receptionist stand up walk around if you can speak to the receptionist make her smile or him smile and also look at the environment so find something to compliment the interviewer on when you go into the interview um, I had a client recently and I was waiting for her to enter the, the um, or not a client, I actually went to do a sales pitch and I was waiting for the lady to come into the room and I was standing up and I was looking around and as she walked in, I gave her a really good handshake, make eye contact and then I complimented her on the art in the foyer and just little things because especially after COVID, a lot of candidates will be being for the same position. So if there's one thing that can make you stand out above your competition, use what you've got. And it's not manipulation, it's just using the skills that you have and make yourself a little bit more likable than you can if you didn't do that. Because people like hearing nice things about themselves, about the environment. So use what you've got um, and don't waste the time that you have sitting in the interview waiting. So engage with the receptionist and also I think people forget that while you sit and wait, people can still observe you. That can be their first impression of you even before they called you in for the interview. 
Yeah. That's that's exactly right. So two really good things in there that stand out for me. Yes, look around your environment and learn. This may be your next workplace. You don't yeah. know. So familiarize yourself with it. You'll get a sense of the culture that perhaps yeah. is there. So, you know, it might be very Kiwiana themed um, artwork on the wall. So that'll give you a sense of, of what um, the company culture might be. But also it's not just the uh, interviewer that may be able Able to observe you without you being aware but um, people in the office so people come and go through receptions and they'll be judging you as well and and they absolutely will be making first impressions and if they get the opportunity to share that with the interviewer which will very often happen um, it could be one tip you one way or the other so that's also that's great okay all right so we'll move on to where are, where am I I've missed my next question. Sorry, can you tell me what my next question was? I sent you a script and yes. I haven't printed it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was about the fact that when you go for an interview, it can be scary. And do I have some tips to share to decrease anxiety? <laughs> Thank you for saving me on that one, Elizabeth. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> um, yes, I think, um, Decreasing anxiety is as much about what you can do as it is what about what you perhaps shouldn't be doing. So I'll clarify that in a second. So what you can do is, again, it comes down to being really well prepared to, for me always, uh, well, I'll talk to my clients and go, make sure that you are prepared in advance. So make sure that you know what you're going to wear. Make sure that if you need to take a CV in or a portfolio or anything like that everything is well set out even the day before your interview because if you're going to scramble and rush you're going to come to the interview feeling rushed feeling more anxious feeling more nervous the other thing is to remind yourself that the physiological um, experience in our body between feeling excited and feeling nervous are very similar so our heart rates go up when we feel anxious. We, we breathe faster when we feel anxious. We have that butterfly in our tummy when we feel anxious, but we have the same experiences when we feel excited about some things. So a lot of the anxiety can be reduced by us telling ourselves that this is gonna be okay, or I'm actually quite excited about this because it's a new opportunity. And even if the interview doesn't work out the way you want it to work out, you can always learn something from that experience and then on the way or before the time you can do a good vocal warm-up um, because when we feel anxious we tend to speak higher and faster so when you find and we do the same when we feel excited so you when you find yourself doing those things you go okay you don't need to rush we just breathe and then speak when you breathe out because it sounds lower and slower so when we speak high and fast, we hold our breath. And so when you go, hi, Kayleen, how are you? Or hi, Kayleen, how are you? So there's a distinct difference in what it sounds like. And so we, when we look for confidence in people, we, we always look for confidence in people because we feel like if other people um, kind of sense out energy of confidence, we feel more confident in them. So you know how you feel when people are really anxious and there's nervous tension, nervous energy around it. That kind of gets transferred between people. And so what employers will be looking for is confidence specifically. And so there's a really, really good study that I just, I geek out on science. And so this, this um, study is done by Professor David Matsumoto. So in 2003, he went to the Olympic Games because he was looking to see if there is confident body language and kind of defeated body language and is it a universal thing so what he found he looked at people who won events at the olympic games and people who lost events and what he found was people who won every all the athletes no matter what their background is their gender their culture their race they displayed similar body behavior with confidence. So they expanded themselves, they had their arms up, they had smiles on their faces, they puffed out their chest, they just, they just 
became bigger and more confident and go sure of themselves. Athletes who lost their events, hunched out, their shoulders rolled in, their heads went down, they had a sad facial expression. Similar to what you could do is if you look at somebody on their phone waiting for an interview. Then he wanted to know whether this is learned behavior or not, because people can see other people do certain things. So we see an athlete win, so we win something and we kind of copy their behavior. So he went to the Paralympics and he looked at um, athletes who were born blind. And when they won certain events and when they lost events, and their body behavior, their facial expressions were very similar to the ones who can see. So our victory dances, our victory stance, and our defeated postures are same. Uh, it's inbred, it's genetic, it's part of our DNA. And so when we see that in other people, we immediately add that trait to them. So if we see confidence, we see victory stance, we see body language that's expansive and confident and sure of themselves, we immediately add confident person to that, that message that we see, that whole picture. If we see somebody hunched over, slouched over, low, kind of small, we immediately go defeated. And so that's part, that's why I say, don't be on your phone while you wait for an interview, because that's part of that first impression. So that's I love, I love yeah. It's amazing that um, people, um, unseeing people, reacted the same way. It's, um, yeah. yeah, you would, I guess it's similar to nature or nurture, but that's not something I would have thought was, was nature. So that's yeah. amazing. So, um, so before we, we should, yeah, present ourselves whilst we're waiting for the interview, set yourself up straight, feel the confidence, understand why you're there, who you are, and um, okay, that's great. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's the one thing that is, that's something that you can do is to present confidently. And obviously, this is not about faking it till you're making it because you can present very confidently, and I can know nothing about why I'm there. But as a recruiter, you won't put me there if you didn't have that trust in me. Mm. So you can, as a candidate, be confident that Kaleen's put you there or your recruiters put you there and they obviously believe in you. So show your skills, show your confidence because you can have that belief in yourself. The other thing is other, other things that we shouldn't do while we're in an interview. So we have a good handshake, we present well, we show our confidence. But then we have what is called self-soothing behavior. Now, when I first heard self-soothing behavior, the first thing that came to my mind was an adult version of sucking your thumb. And in one sense, it is what it is. But self-soothing behavior is any body behavior that we engage in when we feel anxious or nervous or scared. So the speaking high and fast is one thing. The other thing is fidgeting, like clicking a pen, Imagine you're sitting in an interview and doing this all the time. It's going to drive the person dirty. Don't do that. Um, the other thing could be like touching your, your face or your neck or playing with your hair or kind of little, some people actually rock. Um, so any behavior that you engage in when you're feeling really anxious, it's a good thing not to do that. So how do you know that? And I think this is where self-awareness is absolutely key. So unless you're aware that you do these things, you're not going to be able to change it. So find somebody you trust and say to them or ask them, when I'm anxious, what do I do? I didn't actually, for a long time, I didn't realize that I speak faster and higher when I'm nervous or excited. So my husband said to me, slow down, breathe. And it's like, after the fifth time, he said, to me, maybe there's something in this. So we need to have people who are willing to walk that path with us. Or even as a recruiter, you can maybe have a look at those things with your candidates. When they feel nervous, and obviously going to an interview is something that will make you feel nervous a little bit, and that's fine. But to accentuate that is not obviously a good idea. So make sure that when you feel a little bit nervous and you kind of hunch over, you're like, hang on, sit up. So expand yourself a little bit. And you can power pose when you get to your event or your interview. So before you go into your reception area, in the ladies' bathroom or the gents' bathroom, 
stand in a power position, like a superhero position. And it just gives you, if you lift your, your face up, you, you stand in your victory pose, your body will follow, your mind will follow. So when we feel upset and sad, we immediately, our bodies follow our minds, but the reverse is also true. Um, so stand in a power position before the time, and it will just give you, give, give you a little bit of a, a better confident feeling than if you don't do it. There's yeah. actually a study done where they have got people doing a power pose before a mock interview and a group that didn't do the power posing and the interviewers didn't know what these people were asked to do. And the candidates who did the power posing before the time, they scored higher on likability and higher ability than the group who didn't do the power posing before the time. That's absolutely correct. And some people will go, oh, that's rubbish. But it's not rubbish. There is a direct connection between your mind and your body. And we need to, we need to understand that that is simple fact. Okay. So, Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to ask yourself my next question. <laughs> <laughs> it was about, you asked about online interviewing. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like what we're doing here. Yes. Um, so research suggests that was done recently actually that online interviewing is more taxing on the brain than in-person interviewing. And one of the reasons is that when we are in front of somebody and we can actually see them, we make eye contact with them and we can see their faces, we can in our peripheral vision, we can see things around us, we can see their bodies. Whereas when you online you can't make direct eye contact with the person you're speaking to. You can have the impression of direct eye contact from the other person by them looking at the camera, which is really important for creating connection. And I mentioned earlier on when we make eye contact, our brain secretes a chemical called oxytocin, and that helps us with feeling engaged and connected. But the same things for in-person interviewing are obviously important for online interviewing, like be prepared, show up well, dress well, don't show up and wear your slippers or your PJ pants. And I know people joke about it, but I think uh, some people actually do that. When we well dressed, our minds know that and we come across as more confident, more professional. The other tips that I can give you very briefly about online interviewing is make sure that you don't have distractions. Close your email, turn your phone on silent or flight mode because people on the other end of the computer will see if you're distracted or you have notifications binning while you go, while you have your interview and you'll feel more nervous and anxious about it as well. Make sure that you do a video and an audio check before your interview. So if you're on Zoom, open up a meeting for yourself and do those checks because it's not professional looking at all. If I'm looking here and go, oh, my hair's not quite the way. Oh, sorry. You know, it's, that's very unprofessional looking. So make sure that you know what you look like and you're happy with that before you go on camera. Make sure that your audio settings are the way you want it to be because I know I run Boom on my computer. Boom interferes with Zoom boom and zoom and so i have to turn boom off before i go onto a zoom meeting so and it is frustrating i think for the interviewer and anxiety provoking for the interviewee if you go oh i don't know what's going on and can you hear me can you see me all of those kind of things so because our brain works harder during an online interview you as a candidate has a responsibility to make it as easy as possible for the interviewer to connect with you and to engage with you so no distractions, make sure that you're well presented, you've done your audio visual, and visual checks, make sure that they are, um, you're facing a video, or not a video, you're facing a window, because it is just better light, and if you have um, light behind you, you will be silhouetted, and your brain, the other person's brain will have to work harder to be able to see your face. And then make contact with a camera, make eye contact with a camera, as often as you would make eye contact, direct eye contact with a person when you're in person, because it comes across as you making direct eye contact with your interviewer. 
Right, and that's yeah. something that I've still got to master myself. But a couple of points I'd like to make here is being prepared. So I had an incident uh, last year. I was conducting an interview. Now, this woman, she looked fantastic on paper. I'd spoken to her on the phone. She was really great. But when I Zoom interviewed her, it looked like she was replying back in bed. So, <laughs> which I found quite bizarre. Yeah. And I perhaps should have asked her why she was reclined back in bed going through a formal interview. <laughs> but instead, what it did, it just put me, it just um, undid all the good work she had done during the CV and her phone interview. And I just never was able to look past that. So, so that's one point I'd like to make. Um, the next point is um, uh, when you are preparing for an interview, if you're not used to interviewing online, I would really encourage people to record themselves and just pretend yes. somebody's asking them a question, have the question in your mind and then respond to it. Look where your eyes are going, look what your hand gestures are. I'm a big hand gesture person, so I try to keep my a little bit out of the way. <laughs> um, yeah, see what your face looks like, what the lighting is like, and really prepare that way. And it can, a, a recording it and practicing will make you more comfortable with it. And yeah. then the next thing is not everybody will have the luxury of having a distract free environment. So for example, you might have to do the interview on your break, which means you have to go out into the car park, into your car. Mm -hmm. So if that's going to be the case, pre-warn your recruiter who can then pre-warn the interviewee or if you're direct with the company, let them know that's your circumstance so that they can see um, that, that uh, that's been unavoidable. And then they will give you some more tolerance um, and compassion. Yeah, I think with what we've all been experiencing in the last few, several months with COVID and, and even if it's not COVID, other things, people are reasonably forgiving in these things. And I think your point of actually communicating that with the other person just again sets you apart because if you communicate well and they have that expectation of there might be distractions or this is where I am, it just, it just sets you up for being confident, a good communicator, and being able to, um, yeah, just experience, well, not experience, but to communicate really well with the person that you're speaking to. It just makes such a difference, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because it does look actually more prepared when you communicate those things. Say, I knew I was going to be in a car, I know I'm going to be in a place where there may be distractions, and communicating that does show professionalism and preparedness as well, I think. Absolutely. All about communication, verbal and, and non-verbal and body language. So Elizabeth, I just want to really thank you. I've loved talking on this topic with you. We have spoken before. It's a topic that you know has been a passion of mine for many years now. So that was really valuable. So do you have any closing words? And please tell us how um, you can be found. Oh, thank you, Kelly. And thank you again for having me. It was a great honor to be here. Um, closing words, I would say absolutely, and you've mentioned this as well, is being congruent. What you say and what you display need to be the same thing. And the other thing is, the, I, I did mention quite a few tips. So something that you can start practicing before the time is do one skill at a time. Practice good eye contact, practice good handshakes, practice... Um, if you're online, do those visual checks, those audio checks, all those kind of things. Um, and then use your powers for good, not for evil. Because good body language, good communication can be used to manipulate people. And that's not why I teach what I teach. It is absolutely to enhance the overall interaction for both parties. It has to be a win-win situation. Um, but yeah, so, for, but really being, being aware of how you present and be congruent with your words and your nonverbal communication. That's and great. Where you, can, where you can find me, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn at the People Toolbox. And I also have a website called peopletoolbox.nz where I have my packages for my corporate clients. That's great. But I and to connect with anybody who's interested, yeah. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So what we display must be congruent with what we say. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, bye for now. See ya. Thank you. Thanks bye. for watching. Stay safe.